Senate is poised to pass updated energy standards, including a goal of 100% carbon-free electricity generation by the year 2040. Testifiers provided their feedback to the Senate Energy Committee. The climate science demands this, the economy demands this, the opportunities demand this. In the last decade, the cost of solar energy and storage have declined by 85%, and the cost of wind energy has declined by 55%. Solar panels has actually declined 99.75% since I graduated from college uh, some 45 years ago, 99.75% cost reduction. Attempting to decarbonize Minnesota's electricity sector without building new nuclear power plants would cost our state an additional $313 billion through 2050, destroy more than 79,000 jobs, and could lead to devastating rolling blackouts. We do have concerns with the legislation. It is prudent to exercise caution in imposing mandates. The pace of the generation fleet transition must be affordable for our customers in towns like Winger, and it must not generate, it must not jeopardize reliability. Through continued collaboration and partnership alongside of our utilities, this will unleash significant job creation, spur business model innovation, and expand investment across our state. Second, this legislation strengthens Minnesota's energy independence and security. Senator Nick Frentz, the chair of the Senate Energy, Utilities, Environment, and Climate Committee, and the author of Senate File 4, joins me now in the studio. Welcome. Hey, Shannon. Nice to see you again. Since 2007, the state has set energy benchmarks. Some, like the goal of 25% renewable energy by 2025, have already been achieved. The goal of Senate File 4 that everyone is talking about is the 100% carbon-free electricity production by 2040. Is it aspirational or, well, is it possible or is it simply aspirational? It's possible and it's something that I think in 2040 Minnesotans are going to be proud of. We've overcome a lot of challenges, not just in energy but in industry. We fought two world wars, we've had a great depression, we overcame all of them and we're going to meet this challenge and I think we'll meet the 2040 goal of 100% carbon neutral as well and I'm looking forward to it. At a press conference prior to the House taking up the bill, which uh, passed this bill on a party line vote, you said that the approach is agnostic when it comes to technology. What do you mean and why is that approach the right way to go? Well, first of all, it's the right way to go because it's the best way to achieve our goals. What the bill is trying to do is mitigate the effects of climate change and the number one effect is carbon emissions going into the atmosphere. It's heating up the planet and producing all manner of things we don't want. Technology agnostic is a fancy way of saying the utilities must get to 100% by 2040 but they don't have to choose a certain energy mix. It doesn't have to be solar this percentage and wind this percentage. It doesn't have to be hydro during the summer. They can do it whatever way they want. And a key feature of the bill is respect for the utility boards. As you know, we have three types of utilities in Minnesota, investor-owned utilities, cooperatives, and municipal electrics. And all three levels are blessed with outstanding boards who are in the best position to choose which path they use, not only to protect reliability and price, but to go forward from there. Right now, Shannon, unsubsidized wind power is the cheapest, and the bill is going to help drive all utilities of every size to cheaper and just as reliable energy. So we have a variety of, of, of utilities and how they operate, but it's up to them how to get to this 100% benchmark. Exactly, and again, these boards are democratically elected. I'm a member of a rural electric co-op, Hey Benko, in North Mankato. I can tell you that board is educated, engaged, and they are responsive to their members. They're in a perfect position to judge this transition. And by the way, as you mentioned, they're already successfully navigating the 2007 benchmark. So I have a high degree of confidence in those boards to help. Critics are saying that this bill may sharply increase energy costs, perhaps not equally across the state, but that smaller municipal and cooperative utilities may not be able to absorb the level of cost that the larger utilities can absorb. How do you respond? Well, first of all, if we've increased costs for Minnesotans, then part of the bill has been a failure. 
Our goal is to reduce carbon and keep costs in control. So our plan is for small, medium, and large utilities to take advantage of these avenues. And you haven't asked about this, but the IIJA and the IRA, the federal bills, are sending money to our state to help with transmission, to help incentivize the transition to electric vehicles, a lot of stuff that small and large can take advantage of. Also, these utilities have my pledge and the pledge of a lot of other legislators to continue working on this, even if the bill passes, on things that help them with the regulatory framework, things to make it easier. The bill has some of that, by the way, on certificate of need, and also with the costs. We don't want to have any Minnesotans served by utility where they're disadvantaged by the bill. One reason for the bill cited by its proponents is climate change. Speaker Melissa Hortman referred to the increase of 100 and 500 year adverse weather events at a recent press conference. But couldn't those same adverse weather events limit the availability of wind or solar or hydroelectricity? In other words, can the grid operate if the wind doesn't blow or the sun doesn't shine for extended periods of time? Sure. Well, I think you're asking two questions. One, can we reasonably expect the wind to keep blowing and the sun to keep shining? The answer is yes, as best we can judge it. And by the way, uh, since I'm not a scientist, I can say this. Those scientists who study climate, and there are two meteorologists in my caucus now, Senator Mitchell and Senator Kupek, point out that in the 70s and 80s, as climate change started to be studied and understood, many of them predicted exactly what we've seen the temperature increases, the carbon going into the atmosphere. So I think we can rely on them when they say, no, our best guess is the wind's going to keep blowing and the sun's going to keep shining. The second question you ask is, what about the short term when the wind's not blowing and the sun's not shining? Very exciting developments in storage, battery technology. Just an article in a major metropolitan newspaper that I shall not name this week about some of the progress. If we can store energy for 100 hours, we can do a ton, even with our intermittent sources like wind and solar. I'm very optimistic, and I can't resist a second time. That's exactly the kind of innovation that I think Minnesota is well positioned to take advantage of and really to be a leader in. Is it fair to say that this bill is trying to take advantage of technology that is maybe not quite there yet, but probably coming down the pike? Sure, and it's not just technology that's brand new, where people say, wow, I didn't know they could store battery for 100 hours. By the way, we can store now for three or four hours, but that isn't really functional at a utility scale. But an improvement in some of the existing technologies, right now Minnesotans would probably go to sleep if we talked about it, but the improvement in wind turbine efficiency, it's mammoth, it's like 30%. So we are watching wind turbines being uh, retrofitted, if that's the right term, producing a major increase in generation. So it's not just the new things that are coming out that are cool, it's the way we're gonna continue to do things. That's also present in hydroelectric power, carbon capture, and a bunch of other cool stuff. Some may recall the loss of power in Texas in 2021 that was due to a polar vortex event. Many Minnesotans paid higher rates in the aftermath, which highlights the interconnecting web of energy production across the nation. The governor of North Dakota uh, last week uh, threatened to sue the state of Minnesota over some provisions that may or may not be in this bill. Uh, what are your thoughts on other states getting involved and, and their concerns about what we're doing? Well, first of all, it's a great point. If Minnesotans don't know this, we are interconnected on the MISO grid, so we depend on an energy marketplace that includes other states. That's a good thing. In fact, it relates to your point about wind and solar. The sun may not be shining in North Mankato, but it is definitely shining over a lot of that grid, and so collectively that indemnifies us a little bit against the intermittent nature. The Texas storm was an example of a state underfunding resiliency. This is a little bit geeky, but I have some geek DNA in me. Um, one of the things Minnesota utilities do very well is protect against storms, extreme weather, um, so that our power doesn't go out, our transmission doesn't suffer. That's a good thing. Texas, a little bit less regulation, a little bit less requirement, and they paid for it, and it affected us here because that affected the spot price in the marketplaces. But to your other question about North Dakota, first of all, I hope Minnesotans are cheering for the success of North Dakota in general. 
We don't want states cheering against each other. Uh, we revisited the North Dakota issue with some people, and we actually made a small change in the language of Senate File 4, which is to say utilities are expected to procure 100% carbon-free energy um, by generation or to procure it from a carbon-free source. So I'm not trying to mess with anybody's interstate commerce. I'm simply saying we want these utilities to get to that benchmark. And again, those boards are in the best position to do it. One last point on that. If they have an existing contract in 2025 that relies on energy exported from another state, like the great state of North Dakota, those boards are in the best position to say, hey, by 2032, we got to look at this. How does that fit our mix? And that's exactly what we want to have happen. And that's exactly the kind of people we want in charge of that decision. Now, we only have just a brief amount of time left, but there is language in the bill about a preference for local job creation and a preference for domestically produced technologies. Can you talk about that just briefly? Just briefly. Yes. Well, briefly, I'm a big proponent of local jobs. That means Minnesota workers working on Minnesota projects, and the bill gives a preference for that. It also has a preference for domestic production of the materials. We want that. Let's have Minnesota uh, resources as much as possible go into these projects. And I think I've seen success on those uh, types of provisions in other bills, and I'm positive we'll have success with that on this bill, too. Senator Nick Frentz. Thank you. Thank you, Shannon. Good to see you again.